very, very small proportion of all the wind farm proposals that have come forward. Some of them, developers just haven't put the right amount of work into doing the environmental impact assessments properly. And that's, that's bad business. I mean, uh, bringing forward an environmentally friendly technology, but disregarding the environmental uh, legislation and hurdles you have to go across will, will put uh, people off this industry. So it's actually a small proportion of wind farms that we've objected to. We'd start with um, what we call a scoping survey, where we'd do a broad brush assessment of the habitat types present. If there was anything specifically um, there that we might be concerned about, like protected species, then we'd do more detailed surveys to identify the areas that were of particularly, particularly of importance for them. So for great crested newts, that might be wetland areas. For bats, that might be areas with uh, roosts, old trees, uh, that, that kind of feature. Once we've got an initial idea of the habitats that are present and the likelihood of protected species uh, and, and other features of ecological importance, we'll sit down with the developer and look at how we can you know, design the wind farm, the layout of the turbines, the location of access roads, and we'll identify areas where they can be put that are in the least sensitive part of the site. And usually we can find a solution to that. Generally, I think, yeah, we've, we've, we've got a very robust planning process and the quality of impact assessment in this country is very high and I think we've been identifying appropriate sites. And what we, what we find actually is developers are very um, um, quick to move on from sites which are going to be problematic, and that's a good thing from an ecology point of view. So we, we tend to just focus on those sites with the, the fewest constraints. Um, and generally, yeah, I think the, 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 the decision-making process, the, the process of assessment is, uh, is very good, and uh, these, these developments uh, are appropriately cited on the whole. A few years ago, the only thing anyone would have built uh, in Britain for power generation was gas turbines. The government took the view that was undesirable from the risks and from the environmental consequences. And uh, so they introduced a set of supports. Uh, and in particular, what the government wanted to do was to help build up uh, non-emitting power generation industries. Uh, wind energy has proved to be the front runner under those support schemes. Uh, and it's very clear, if you want industry to take big financial risks and build up new clean industries, they've got to be supports there. It is certainly true that there are, there are some special uh, deals for renewables which are clearly published and they are creating the market. Those will be there for some time in order to bring the full, to allow wind energy to realise its full potential. And they are actually there for uh, other sources as well. The difference now is that there is the beginnings of a costing of the environmental damage done by conventionals. So it may be health, maybe damage to buildings, maybe damage to the environment, maybe create storms, but there's something in there. And the logical thing to do is to sum together the cash cost uh, and the environmental cost and, and put them together in, in, in one package. Or, if you can't do that, to give an environmental cost benefit, so an, a cash encouragement to clean forms of generation. So we should be looking at all of this generation in the round. We should be looking not just at cash, but at the total package. When the proposal came through for the developer to build a wind farm in Adrosan, there was a lot of excitement in this small town, you know, because this was something new to us. The only, the closest anyone had seen a wind farm was on the television or read about it in the paper. Uh, there were some concerns. Some people mentioned, um, would, would it be noisy? or oh, it's going to look ugly up in the hillside. So at that point, people were reserving their judgment, oh, we'll wait and see. That was what they said, we'll wait and see. Once the turbines went up, they were slow to come round and say, well, actually, they don't look too bad. And other people thought, wow, that's, that's quite nice looking up and seeing the, the turbines. Uh, and I heard other people saying, you know, it's, it's quite soothing. It has a, a calming effect when we look up there in the morning because we're all quite close to wherever you are in a draw and you can see the wind turbines. Um, so, yes, there was a change. And I feel that the local people are now boasting about having a wind farm in a draw We've had uh, coach loads of people coming to, to, to go up and see them close up just to see how high they are and if there's any noise closer up, and there isn't. So yes, it has become a tourist attraction and local people have taken ownership of the wind farm. 
you know, they're actually proud to have it here now. Well, I, th I think it's just nonsense uh, that, uh, that a wind turbine is going to, t to take a, an effect on tourism. I think it's actually going to enhance it. And we, of course, have this unique turbine that actually attracts tourists that, because they can have an intimate experience with it. So they can get rid of some of the fears they might have about wind turbines. Uh, we get people coming here um, who are probably very undecided as to whether they really want to support a wind turbine in their area and when they leave most of them have changed their mind. My point of view we've had people come into the information center who own hotels and bed and breakfast places in the town and they've asked me for brochures for their customers because they've had a lot of questions about them and a lot of people come down here to, just to see the actual wind farm so don't worry at all is my answer. We get one or two people who think they're ugly, but that's all really. There was one or two concerns about the seals originally, but there's no concern now because the seals are still there. There's still the boat trips out to see them. Um, they were One or two people were worried about birds flying into them, into the turbines, but that hasn't happened. So really, there's no concerns whatsoever. For those who are concerned about the impact of wind farms particularly in terms of visual amenity, landscape and so on. I'm afraid I feel pretty robust about this. And my message to them is, well, you may see a change in the landscapes that you cherish, but that change is going to be a lot less horrible than the changes we're going to get through extreme climate change. And we all have to understand the nature of that changing, shifting pattern of climate and landscape. So. The nimbyism that is still there, if you like. In special places, I admit we shouldn't proceed with onshore wind farms, but for me, most places actually are in game for good, well-designed, well-built wind developments of the kind we're seeing. There are two ways of looking at the cost of energy from anything, and a wind farm is no exception. One is catch cost, which we're all familiar with. The other is energy cost. And the, the definition of, of energy cost is, well, how much energy does it take to make the thing? Uh, how much energy does it produce in its lifetime? And there was some suggestion that uh, a wind turbine does not repay what we call its energy debt, so the difference between those two numbers. And this is really just complete nonsense. Uh, on a good Welsh site or a good Scottish site, the uh, turbine will, will produce as much energy as, as was taken to make it in about six months or less. If you come further south to less windy places, clearly that goes up, but it might be a year in the south of England. So it's, it's very much uh, a good payer of its debt.